<laughs> I am so excited to be here to host this panel, uh, the first panel of the Gish Mini Hunt. And it is the most interesting, not to insult the other guests, because I'm going to say that on every panel, but this is on falconry. And we have a special guest here, Misha Collins, to join us. Hi, Misha. Hi, and I have I brought with me um, uh, my plus two Weston Mason here. Very nice. How do you know these two? Uh, they are my assistants. They, they work for me. <laughs> Got you. Okay, great. Well, that's wonderful. Um, I they it seems like they're very industrious, and they're going to bring you tea and whatnot. Yep. Okay, good. Um, and our actual special guest is going to be <laughs> no insult, Rodney Stotts who is, an, is a falconer, and uh, I'm very excited to share his life with you guys through his mouth <laughs> and learn about what he does and how much good he does in the world, as well as taking care of these magnificent creatures. Rodney, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you guys for having me. I truly appreciate it. Well, it's, it's wonderful. The, the theme of this weekend's activities is wizards and weirdos, so I'm sure you have a lot of people who like to dress as elves come to talk to you about <laughs> <laughs> your birds. <laughs> um, Rodney, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are unfamiliar with you and your work. So I'm so excited to do a deep dive into you. Can you tell just the audience a little bit about your organization and what you do before we deep dive into your background? Sure, my name is Rodney Stotts. I'm a licensed falconer. I used to run a program called Earth Conservation Corps, which based in Washington, D.C. There's an offshoot to it called Wings Over America. Uh, the programs that were for adjudicated youth. So I started a program called Rodney's Raptors because when I became a falconer, I'm able to have my own raptors possess and train my own birds. So I wanted everyone to be able to experience not just people that had to been in trouble, the sport of falconry, the love of the animal of the, to get out in nature, explore nature again. Yeah, it's amazing. And uh, Misha, uh... Feel free to ask Rodney any questions. Okay, uh, well, my kids have a question here, which is uh, what kind of falcon is that that is sitting on your uh, on your hand there? Actually, this is, a, this is what's called a Harris hawk. Falcons and hawks, they're two different types of raptors. Falcons have a little notch in their beak. So when they make their kill, they usually catch birds so they can catch them and they can actually decompose de Decapitate the bird, basically break his neck so that the bird can't turn around and eat him. Hawks actually land on their prey and start to eat while it's still alive. So actually falconry is the sport of kings and queens because the death that the birds give are considered a noble death. So you had to be of mm. uh, royalty in order to have falcons. Commoners such as me would have a hawk. So I can take my bird out anywhere and fly my bird, get a group of people to come around and I can teach them about nature, about the birds, about animals. You pretty much have everyone's attention. So this is a Harris hawk, it's a desert bird and they're called the wolf pack of the sky. These are the only birds that will hunt in a family group. So Misha, you can have one, your son and daughter can have one, I have one, the other hosts have one and we all meet up together. The birds will start talking to each other we're sitting there looking just as crazy because we don't understand what they're saying, but they're telling each other, you're first, I'm second, you're third. And when we release them, they'll hunt as a pack and they'll share in the kill. This is the only species that does it. Wow. wow. And so they pick, they pick, they choose a pecking order. At the, like, oh, wow. That's yes. amazing. And so usually that... the largest female wins. As huh. it should be. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so does that allow them to take down bigger prey? So like as an aggregate, they can take out a larger animal or does it, is it just a situation where they can hunt more efficiently? Well, both actually, by them being desert birds, there are really no trees, they're cactuses. So they have a natural fear of dogs because their uh, nests are so low. But because there are really no trees, there's nowhere for them to perch up on and actually hunt. Oh. So jackrabbits are huge rabbits for one bird of this size to take down. So the males are 30 to 40% smaller, but they're faster. So the males will fly in, grab the rabbit. The females come in, which are 30% bigger and help to make the kills. So they all hunt it as a group. 
So that's why they all share it all as a group that same way. So they're able to mm -hmm. take down larger prey and hunt more efficiently, yes. Wow. And what inspired, were you always interested in this, these animals in particular? What kind of sparked your interest in working with these animals? I've always been an animal junkie. I never really was a people person. Mm. I used to yeah. be a bad guy back in the late 80s, early 90s, lived that crazy lifestyle thinking that that's what life was really about. Ended up going to 33 funerals in one year and having to make a decision that that's not what you really wanted to do anymore. Before my mom passed away a few years ago, she was always proud of me. She wasn't always proud of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But I got to make her proud of what I was doing before she left here. So seeing that change in her, knowing that what I started doing with the animals and it, the way it touched her and others, and it was actually changing me, I could never go back. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. Sorry, I'm tearing up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to no. make you no, it's so wonderful. Well, anyone who takes, I have a special uh, place in my heart for animals as well, because they, they can't defend themselves against us. We're a little too pow uh, powerful in a lot of ways. And a lot of people don't have empathy toward that. And the fact that you can uh, have made, you were able to make such a, a big life change and then turn your generosity and your energy to those who can't defend themselves. Uh, it's just so wonderful. Uh, just very inspiring. Uh, Misha, do you, yeah. Um, I, so, so what is, what is, can, can you just for, for these guys are curious, what is the sport of, of falconry, like in a nutshell for people who have never heard of it before? Falconry is the oldest land sport known to man. Before you had any weapon, any gun, any spear, anything, you used your bird to actually trap food for your family. So when you took your hawk out, and your hawk actually caught a rabbit for your family that day, you would transfer and give the bird a piece of food, take the rabbit, put it in a bag. You would take the bird out again, let him hunt again. So now you're actually getting food for your family and you're actually rewarding the bird for hunting for you. So before you had anything that you can catch a rabbit that was a hundred yards away from you, you had your bird. So it's the oldest land sport known to man. Oh. When, when did that start? Was that like medieval times or? Yes, yes. You can go into the oldest caves. And you'll see nothing but the hieroglyphics of hawks, owls, eagles, birds. They've been, from the beginning of time, basically you've been using a bird for something. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So that relationship has coexisted for a long, long time. Just like domestication of dogs or cats or things like that. It was a little different with falconry though, because what you're actually doing in falconry, you're only trapping juvenile birds. But here, oh. 80 to 90% of red-tailed hawks won't make it through their first winter. So when you're a falconer and you trap a juvenile bird, what you're actually doing is helping that bird make it through that first winter. So when you release that bird, now it has a 90% chance of survival and actually reproducing. So now that that species won't start to decline because Falconers actually only can take juveniles to help them become adults, so wow. that the population doesn't decline. So you have to uh, you have to capture already born but very small. Not you don't you don't raise them from an egg or something. You you oh, no go up. No ma'am. Unless you're breeding, you're trapping a bird. It's not a very small bird. The bird is basically uh, around thirteen hundred grams to a thousand grams, depending on if it's a male or female. So mm -hmm. the bird is pretty much the size that it's going to be for the rest of its life. It may grow a little more, but it's not going to grow significantly more. So mm -hmm. when you're out trapping, you can tell by the plumage what the bird is, if it's an adult or juvenile. So okay. once you realize that it's a juvenile, that you can keep. If it's an adult, then you just check him, make sure he's okay, and release that bird back into the wild. Wow. Uh, what, was your, what was the first bird you were able to handle? Do you remember the kind of bird or the name? What, what, and how did you, how did you get, get in contact with that bird? I was working with a nonprofit. And we were doing a raptor education program. So the very first bird that I ever held was a Eurasian eagle owl. I still have them to this day He's at our other facility right now. The first bird that ever flew to me actually was this species here, which was a Harris hawk, which kind of pushed me into knowing that I was going to become a falcon. Wow. So there's a lot of difference between the, the large birds, the eagles, and are, do people even 
keep eagles or is it just a rehabilitation situation? Yes, basically they're all under the Migratory Bird Act, which means they're all federally protected. So eagles and stuff, even though they're still on the um, threatened list, I believe they're on the, still on the threatened list. However, you don't hunt with eagles. Falconers really don't hunt with eagles. So you wouldn't put an eagle on a falconry license. Mm. All raptors hunt, but you, you really won't hunt using all raptors, like owls or raptors, but you wouldn't use an owl to hunt because mm. they're mostly active at night so you wouldn't be out in the middle of the night trying to hunt your bird so sense, depending yeah. on the species yes ma'am so falconry is you can have a raptor there are specific raptors that you would use you wouldn't just take any bird to use to hunt wow misha have you ever held a, a large bird like this uh i have once i i believe it's kind of thrilling um uh, Mason had a question, which is how old is this this bird that's perched on you? This bird is nine years old now. Her name is Agnes. She's actually named after a lady named Agnes Nixon, who used to write the soap operas, One Life to Live and All My Children. What? She actually bought this bird for me seven years ago. <laughs> that, that She bought the bird for you? <laughs> Falconers <laughs> yes. breed certain species of birds, and because you're in a different area, this bird is not common here. So, if you're a falconer and you want a specific type of bird, then you can. Have, they're breeders, so you can get that bird. And I called her one day. I said, "Ma, I want me a pair of Harris hawks." She said, "Come get the money, find your birds." And two weeks later, I had my birds. That's incredible. How many birds do you have, Rodney? Right now, I have five Harris Hawks and one red tail, a Eurasian Eagle Owl, and two Kestrels. And how are the, how, that's a lot of birds you have to feed, <laughs> and every day you have to feed all of them. Well, technically, you don't have to feed them every day if you feed them up. There are different mm -hmm. weights that you can keep them at. You never want them at a hunting weight unless you're going to hunt your bird, because if keeping them at that weight for so long can actually hurt your bird. So oh. you want to keep fed up which now they're going into the molting part of their uh, season so you'll put your birds up and you'll just feed them so they can molt all the old feathers out and new feathers will come in so these feathers that you see today in two months will be all different feathers wow and, and that's and how, in the winter they 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 molt all their feathers no no the winter time is when you actually hunt your bird in the spring and summer, there's leaves foliage on the trees. If you let a bird go and it flies up into the tree, you can't see your bird, your bird can't see you. So you only hunt your bird in the fall and winter when it's cold enough. Now there's no foliage on the trees. I can see my bird for a quarter mile, whatever tree he's on, he can see me or she can see me. So when I call for him, there's a direct line of sight. But once you start putting those obstacles in the way like of the trees, your bird went one way looking for you, you went another way looking for your bird You've just lost that bird. Wow. wow. And do and do, have you ever had a bird fly away but then find you again? Or basically, once you're out of sight of it, it's going to be really hard to reunite with them. Well, you can find them. What you do when you fly them, you have a bell connected to their leg. Because when they're flying, you won't hear them go from tree to tree. So once you hear that ching ling ling ling, you know to look up to make sure where your bird is going to make sure it's following you or something to that effect. If your bird ever gets loose and it doesn't have a bell or telemetry, there's a good chance you'll never get that bird back. Wow. That's have sad. you lost birds? Have you, I'm sorry. Have you lost birds? Yes, I've lost birds. I've had birds pass away. Um, I've had one bird that actually got my very first red tail escaped a week before I was going to release them. So I wasn't really upset that he got away. I was more upset that I didn't need to take all of the equipment off of them. But the oh. Jess's necklace that we use are basically they can pull them off and they'll come off. So when you, if your bird ever gets lost, you don't have too much stuff on them that can hang them up in a tree or something like that. You still want them to be able to survive. What kind of training do you have to do to become a falconer? How long does it take and how, how intensive is it? What do you have to do exactly to become, because you're licensed, you have a license from the government to be able to hold these birds and, and uh, how, what, what does that entail? Well, first what you'd have to do is have a love for the, the animals themselves because it's not something that you want to get into and then get right out of. 
a lot of times when people find out everything involved with it, they'll stop. But you'll mm-hmm. find a person that will sponsor you, who's a general or master falconer, that tells the government they will sponsor you and teach you everything you need to know. You'll become their apprentice and you'll take a test. Once you pass that test, you'll have an aviary, which is the house, the room that your birds will be housed in. They'll come out and inspect it and make sure that it meets all of the qualifications to house that bird safely and humanely. So once they pass that, your sponsor takes you out, you go trapping, you catch your first bird, then he teaches you how to keep the bird to sit on the glove, to eat from the glove, to start hopping to the glove, to follow you, to now hunt with you. you. It's not hunting for you, it's hunting with you. If mm-hmm. you ever make your bird think it works for you, you're going to lose that bird. Wow. So the, di- the power dynamic is very much a cooperative experience yes. versus like you're working for me. Yes. Wow. Yes. Believe me, with this, though, it will teach you patience, understanding, everything that you would think you couldn't possibly learn from this to better yourself in turn. You, you will, because there's nothing you can say, hey, stop doing that. The bird looks at you, it has no idea of what you're talking about. It's not like you said, you domesticate a dog, sit, stay. You t- sit, stay, the bird has no idea. So you, if it's doing something that you didn't want it to do, you have to now find a way to correct it. And so it, it's actually, te- it taught me a lot even dealing with my kids, because it made me realize certain things I had to go back and look at it from a different angle and I saw it a different way and was able to handle things differently. So it teaches you, I mean, just it, it can check, it transforms you. Wow. Which you did with me, actually. Wow. Hey, stand up. Are your kid? how old are your kids? My youngest son is 26. Oh. <laughs> no little babies anymore. I have seven, eight, nine, 10 biological grandchildren. Wow. Uh, Are any of them as passionate about birds as you are? Oh, yes. Actually, my son, there's a, we have a documentary out um, on YouTube. It's called Look Up. And my son, he's a DC firefighter and he's actually a falconer. His daughters come out here with me. We actually have horses and everything. We run a program called Healing with Hawks and Horses because they just to be there to brush a horse or to sit there and hold a, it, it really just takes you somewhere else. It can really heal you. And so they, they're doing it also. I have my youngest son just had a son and he's actually Rodney starts the third now. So we have a, another falconer that's only four months old, but we'll get a glove made for him. And yes, ma'am. So we'll- <laughs> Some of the people in the chat are asking, how, what do you feed them? So if, if you're not, I, I assume you don't go hunt them every day. And obviously in the spring and summer, you can't. What do you feed them? Do you feed, do you have to feed them live animals or are they able to be given frozen just like snakes or something? Like how do you? Yes, you would throw it. You would give them mice, snakes, rabbits, squirrels. Excuse me. NIH actually gives you the mice and rats for free. If you're a really? falconer and run programs. Yeah, so you can actually go to NIH. Call them and let them know that you are a licensed falconer. They'll tell you to bring a copy of your falconry license. And they'll, that way, the mice and things that you're feeding your birds won't have any poisons or contaminants or anything like that in it. When you actually hunt your birds, that's when you're actually worried about any poisons that the bird may have caught from the food that it caught out. If you go through NIH, you'll have all the mice and rats. You can do two pickups a year, so you'll have enough to feed your birds. Wow. So you don't give them. You don't want to give them live prey inside their aviaries because then they'll start crashing around and end up getting injured trying to chase it. So if you're going to do that, you'll bring them out and put them on a creance cord and let them just stay hunting just to keep them sharp every so often. Misha. Yeah. What kind of bird are you going to get your family? Do you think? <laughs> Do you have a, a parakeet? Do you have any kind of birds? Have you guys had a bird pet? No, um, but we have a friend who, uh, the wizard, who has uh, a parrot, um, uh, two parrots, and uh, they have been quite loud uh, uh, guests in the house. And uh, and I had a, um, a a parakeet that a friend uh, would have me house sit for, or, or have me babysit when he was out of town and he would just perch on my shoulder and shit down my back all day while I was on yep. my computer. Yep. Uh, 
What about you, Felicia? You know, my grandma had a red, uh, a, I think a red-headed parrot, a small little parrot named Chili. She still has them because she, they, la- they live a long time. She also has a macaw named Reba. And I have learned how incredibly loud and obnoxious <laughs> and how I don't think they're very happy when they're not flying. So I've chosen not to have a bird. But I do think they are so intelligent. And I always have, I have a little relationship with the crows in my area because I feel like they're super smart and I'm always on their side. You know, I'm always like, hey, crows, because I don't want to piss them off. (laughs) Rodney, do you notice a big difference in the personality of the different species that you have? Are some smarter or some more uh, uh, relate to you better? Are some of them want to be around you more? Or some of them are very, very just always going to be feral, like, what, what species difference do you notice? Well, technically, with me, it's not a difference. If you love something, it loves you. So mm-hmm. all of my birds, all of my horses, all of my dogs, all of my animals, I can do everything that I do with one to the other. Some particular birds that you trap, you get a bond with, but you know you can't hold that bond because you're going to let that bird go. You don't want to keep that bird. Mm-hmm. However, your birds that you, your animals that you have, they are all a little different. They all have their little attitudes on certain days. Like her, she was screaming at Chuck earlier because he was sitting here typing on a computer. And I guess she wasn't getting the attention that she wanted, so she started making noise. And Chuck <laughs> asked, well, what was I don't, she just wanted it, I guess, wanted some attention. So each <laughs> one of them will do what they want to do when they want something, but they all love to be cuddled up with, touched, held, especially once you start doing it and you desensitize them to it because they have a natural fear of us. Mm -hmm. So when you let them know that I'm not gonna harm you and I'm not gonna let anyone else do it either. That bond, then you, of course they wanna snuggle all up on you and you can hold them on their beak and pull them down and kiss them on the top of the forehead. And (laughs) so they all, it's it's the same with all my animals. So I mean, it's the difference with other people, I see little things, but with me, like I said, once you love something, and I guess it's like you guys said, when you're giving it out and you you, you just, you don't want to see anything hurting, they don't want to see you hurting. So on your yeah. worst days, this is something. I tell you, Misha, get up, get your falconry license and come fly with me. On oh. one of the days where you feel that the whole world has come down on you, we'll take our birds out and send them up. And I guarantee you, it'll change your life from that moment on. Because the people, especially if your bird is named after someone that you love, because when people pass, what's the first thing we say? They're up there looking down on us, right? Well, where's your bird? 60 feet in the air doing what? Flying over, looking down on you. So if that bird is named after someone that you love, they're never gone. They're just sitting there flying over you, looking down on you. So even on your worst day, that bird will make you smile. Mm. So beautiful. That is lovely. Anne Holland asks, my daughter Aria wants to know if Rodney has ever eaten anything his bird has caught. Have you ever eaten an no. animal? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> because usually what they'll catch is squirrels and rabbits and everything. And because we now have a grocery store. <laughs> 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 that they catch. But no, I, what I do is the other birds that don't go out on a hunt that day, I make sure they get what the other birds caught also. So all of the birds get to share in the, the different um, foods and everything, the different treats, basically. Yeah. So they're not just on one consistent diet. Uh, Raven Reed asks, I have a question for Mr. Stotts. In your professional opinion, can a wheelchair user become a falconer? Yes, yes. I have a, oh, I'm sorry, I had a cousin. He passed away about a year ago. His name was Joe. We were out trapping one day and he called me. He said, cuz, where you at? I said, I'm at Rosecroft Racetrack trapping. He said, I'm on my way. He had been paralyzed, he had been shot and he was paralyzed from the waist to his chest down. 40 minutes later, he comes down this, if anyone knows where that hill is, the real windy hill, he's flying down the hill in his wheelchair to come and go trapping with me. So I put a glove on his hand blew the whistle because I had my other birds out and my bird would fly to him. So as long as there's a a walkway, a pathway, anything that you can go down through, 
there's no limitations on being a falcon. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I don't want to end, we, we are coming up on time. I don't want to end before you get to say a little bit about Rodney's Raptors and the advocacy work and the education you do with kids. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I want to make sure we understand what you do so people can support you afterwards. Oh, sure. I, I, um, I do Rodney's Raptors. Like I said, it started because the program that I was working with was for adjudicated youth. So if someone hadn't gotten in trouble we technically couldn't help you. And I thought that that was real crazy. If you want to stop the recidivism rate, stop them from going to jail to begin with. So I started Rodney's Raptors so that I can actually teach people about falconry, about birds, about the outdoors. So I go to schools, out, um, hospitals. I just did a Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, for a little girl named Netta. I did, do birthday parties for little kids, for the elderly. Just go out and educate or do Go down to the malls and walk around and take the birds and the horses just to show people that, you know, the nature, just the animals, it's a healing. With I've never run into anyone with my animals that frowned or didn't start to smile. And then you get letters and calls later saying how it helped change their life and save their life. And, and I explained to them, I know exactly where you're coming from because I used to be one of those people that you never would have wanted to invite to your home realizing that I was being more of a part of a problem than the solution. When I started learning that and becoming a part of the solution and the birds and the people drawing to me, and we were going to neighborhoods where this was the highest murder rate, but you pull a bird out and everyone's sitting there, oh my God, man, oh, because of exposure. You're not exposed to something, you don't know about it. So I, that's one of the main things I try to do. So the program I'm running now is called Dippy's Dream. It's named after my mom. I was actually able to get a house down in Charlotte Courthouse, Virginia. So I'm starting a camp down there where people can come and camp out on the weekends and it's free. And I tell you, just make a donation, whatever you can afford. Because you can't afford something doesn't mean you don't deserve it. You can go out and feed the homeless every day and be, almost be homeless yourself, but you couldn't afford horseback riding lessons. Does that mean you don't deserve them? No, it just means you couldn't afford them. Well, I have a horse. And if you want to ride them, I'll surely teach you how to ride them and I won't charge you a dime. And that's what it's all about. If you can make someone smile, my mom used to always tell me, if you can make someone smile and you didn't, shame on you. Amazing. So, You're so amazing, Rodney. Uh, I, uh, I urge everybody to go to check out Rodney's Raptors and support him and what he does and Obviously we have 200 questions that we cannot get to. So you have touched, uh, sparked a lot of curiosity and your, 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 your words about kindness are particularly important because of this gish hunt. There are a lot of uh, generosity and kind, kindness items on the list and hopefully that spirit can be carried through in people's lives. Misha, do you have any last question for Rodney? No, I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you. Uh, that was really inspiring. And, and it was such a nice reminder that I think in the modern world, so many of us have lost connection with animals and nature and how important it is to our souls and spirits and, um, and frankly, to our own um, feelings of empathy toward one another um, in the world. So thank you for, for that little reminder. And um, you guys have anything you want to say? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, you Rodney. Bye -bye. Yeah. You want to say bye? Say bye-bye. Bye, -bye. bye Agnes. Oh, nice work. Bye, Agnes. <laughs> and oh, just a reminder, you got the next panel will be Enigmatology at 12. Okay. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're still going. You're still going. Oh, wait, I'm still going. Okay. The next panel will be Enigmatology at 12 p.m. Pacific. So I will see you then. Get your puzzles ready. And make sure to check out Rodney's website. All right, bye. Bye, thank you, bye, everybody. Bye, and check out, <clears throat> check out the list. You've got your challenge up there. It's 54 points. Image, oh. Rodney's Raptors teamed up with at-risk young people to create a sanctuary and habitat for raptors. And the result was life-changing for all. An homage, uh, build a castle turret birdhouse or birdbath for the birds in your own backyard, all out of wild safe, wildlife safe materials. Enlist the help of a young person if you can safely do so. Nice work, everybody. All right. And that's the list. All right, you guys. Have a wonderful one. See you in a couple hours. Thank you, Rodney and Agnes. Bye. Bye.